welcome to Posca Nova. And look who my special guest is today, Virgil. So, first of all, welcome to my local coffee shop. It's wonderful to be here, Mike. I've been actually imagining this moment for quite a while, being on the south coast of England, by the ocean, ocean breeze, good coffee actually, very good, very good. That's good surprisingly. Over. Cheers. Cheers. So, how important, when you're on the road, someone like you, is like coffee shops, places that you do, to make you feel like, you know, home comforts? Well, when it comes specifically to coffee, you can never underestimate the value of being properly caffeinated when you're on the road. Mm. But sometimes it comes in different forms. Sometimes as a cup of coffee, other times as a good run on the beach. I like that natural source of energy, you know. And it, it, in fact, it's funny because if I, if I do a workout first thing in the morning when I'm on the road, it, it sets up my whole day, but not only that, I then don't feel the need for any stimulant like caffeine. Um, and I usually, uh, I, I postpone it for at least a couple of hours. And, but on other occasions, like today, travel day, really no time between this conversation and going to sound check, yeah, a cup of coffee is good. It tricks your mind into thinking you're in a good mood for at least 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so you need another one in 20 minutes? Yeah, I think so. We'll, we'll, keep, them, we'll keep them coming, please. So yeah. you think that um, uh, those home comforts then, when you're out on the road, are important for, for you know, to have your feet on the ground? And Strangely enough, you, I, I've learned to know that, okay, you're going on the road, you're going to have to make some compromises. There are going to be good days, bad days, Bad meaning challenging uh, in terms of you know getting getting access to any of those home comforts. Um, I try and bring some with me as well on the okay. road. I always have the feel good things that I need, and I'm very I'm very uh, demanding in terms of uh, what I consume, food, etc. Mm. So I'll always bring a few things that get me through those times when I can't get to what I need. I, I absolutely avoid junk food. I, I, I won't compromise there. I don't like it. Yeah. And so I'll always have, say, a, a you know, bag of, of muesli, like just oh, some basic energy food that I can just add hot water to when there's no time or when there's no, no access to good food. Um, I always bring some of my uh, important supplements that help me feel good. Mm. Um, and that's usually enough, that's all I need, just some basics to get me through. I'll buy some fruit, always have some fruit and nuts on hand. And uh, worst, worst case, if, if, if we don't get to eat or we don't get time to find anything decent, yeah, you've got I get by on that, yeah. I mean, I know you're also a very keen photographer, so the camera goes with you everywhere. Oh yeah, camera, yeah. camera Literally everywhere, you. right next to you. There yes. you go. I like, I like to... Uh, well, nowadays, you know, of course, we, we have to keep up uh, our social media presence. We that's yeah. part of, yeah. you know, the artistic profile, and that requires that's more demanding. There's more time that you have to put into it. So, I, li I like quality. You know, I like to put a little time and effort into what I, what image I portray out there. So, uh, sometimes it's good to just put up, you know, random, quick iPhone rehearsal clips or, uh, or, or pics. Or us but at the BBC like yesterday. Us at the or BBC. Right, yeah. But sometimes I, I prefer to, you know, I'll put it, I'll record on a good camera. Yeah. I'll, uh, in terms of performance, I'll record audio as well, multi-track. I'll be sitting in the, in the tour van editing and yeah. mixing as we go along day to day. And I, I like to, to put good content out there, good quality, something that people can enjoy. Yeah. And uh, I think that's important. And, and, you know, I think people appreciate that too. But do you think uh, that is because um, looking for the right term, you're not a control freak, but you like control of what you're producing. Do you think that's because 
that's in your nature or do you think that you're tired of seeing content out there that hasn't been produced well hasn't been done well and you want to portray something a little bit more special well that, I think that's a very good question and there are there are probably many sides to that the way you can answer that and the, the, the quick answer for me is that yes I like control because this is this is my life's work and what I put out there for me is important you know to produce it in the best possible light and uh, I I've accepted that there's always going to be you know the I, quick iPhone dirty audio uh, clips that are going to get on online and some of that's okay too it captures a certain essence I prefer not to have those get out of control you know like thousands of people just posting bad quality clips but on the other hand like I said I do take the time and effort to on tour to, to produce good quality clips quite frequently not every gig but I'll try and film and record quite a few gigs each week on the road and I'll post some some good quality clips so if I'm doing that I feel like it's not necessary to have all these these, like I call them, dirty clips yeah. up online that, that probably, I don't know if they're doing me a favour in any, any way, you know. I know that the die-hard fans will like to look at anything they can get their hands on, no matter the quality. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, I, 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 I prefer to opt for the, uh, the, refined, the more refined right. version. So while we're on that subject regarding the die-hard fans, the what we are now dealing with with social media how do you cope with or our generation being not used to social media and has come into our life how do you cope with you know the trolls the negativity that come out of these do you take any notice of it does it hurt or not really I, I look you, you just I, I really don't have much to complain about because I find that you're, you're always going to have you're going to have the people, the haters, the people that just want to go after you, and you'll find that behind behind those profiles is really no one. It's yeah. someone who's created a fake fake profile, and they obviously just enjoy going out and trolling. And you know, you can either just choose to block those people or, or just let the comments fly. And uh, um, you never respond. No, it's not it's a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and quite often, to be honest with you, apart from moments after I've posted it, say after half an hour, I'm moving on. Like, yeah. I don't have time to continually look back and forth. That You know, I've got Twitter posts, Instagram, um, Facebook, and, you know, it's, you know I'm, I'm busy playing and rehearsing and, and, and touring and traveling. And, yeah, I'll randomly, you know, airport, whatever, tour van, you'll have a quick look, a little bit. Sometimes, if, I'm, if I've had caffeine, I'm in a good mood, I'll reply. Other times, you just can't because there's just too many. Okay, so let's, let's go back. So, you made a big jump, obviously, to move from Australia to yeah. LA, I think, 20, 25 years ago. Is that correct? Or uh, longer 23 more? years ago. Okay, 23 years ago. So, what made you decide that? And, and when you came into LA, how hard was it for you to be accepted and start you know, well, making an name for yourself? It was, a, it was a very big step. I mean, I moved from Australia. I was already in my mid-30s. I thought if I don't do it now, it will never happen. And look, Australia was great to me. So many opportunities. A lot of... For the country of its population... I won't say its size because it's a big country, but yeah. the population is very small. There were a remarkable amount of gigs all my life growing up and so it was a wonderful uh, honing ground like I was able to really get my skills together and, and experience it. but then it came to the time where you're very isolated Australia is an isolated island way down there and to try and get anywhere and try and get, get any kind of uh, interactivity with the rest of the musical world and internationally it's really difficult right, okay so I decided, well, you know what, I'm going to do this, I'm just going to move, and it's going to be difficult, 
You're moving with all the greatest musicians are, greatest players, have already established themselves. They did it from an early age. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to try and somehow jump in that pool of talent and try and make a statement. And I did it. It was uh, around 90, late 96, early 97 okay. when I moved and settled into LA and really enjoyed it. Found myself a rehearsal room as quickly as possible and I've been in the same studio ever since. Um, and just, just kept doing what I'm doing. I didn't really know how I was going to do what I... So can you know. we remember going back at that stage, right at the beginning, I mean, obviously you were an established name in Australia, mm -hmm. you'd made a name for yourself, and made that move to LA. Do you remember that first couple of weeks? Do you remember maybe if you felt homesick? Did you, do, did no. you ever regret that? No, I... I guess there was a little anxiety at first, you know, leading up to my departure from, you know, just... Just you wonder about, okay, where's this going? What's going to happen in my life? Am I going to be able to survive, etc. But once I was there, yeah, no homesickness. I just felt, I felt good about what, what I was attempting to do. And I felt quite comfortable. I, I, I was so fortunate. I remember the first, the first uh, few weeks I was there, I, I, I had... Um, I met some wonderful people and they were really helpful. For example, there was one guy who was at the time working at, at the Musicians Institute in LA and he kindly offered one of the rooms there, one of the practice rooms. He said, you can use it, you know, come up and practice if you need it, you know, until you set yourself up. Yeah. So at least I had a place where I could keep playing for the first uh, couple of months yeah. until I found this, this uh, lockout studio. You know, the, all those little, little signs of kindness yeah. from people really help, you know, when you try and establish yourself in a new place. And um, At the same time, I'd already released one or two of my videos uh, through, from Australia, yep. Power Drumming, yep. and that somehow generated some interest, in, some interest, at least in the, in the drumming community. Yeah. And I was already... Uh, my association with, with Sabian and at the time it was Premier Drums, uh, a good British company. We were, uh, you know, we they were putting me to work. I was already doing clinics. So that was another really helpful step in my move. Uh, I came to, uh, the, you know, Europe quite a few times in those early, early days. And uh, also... Um, then started doing clinics, you know, kind of, there was a bit of a buzz spreading and started doing clinics. So eventually I started networking with musicians, started playing on some records. Uh, out of that came a lot of collaborations and so on and so forth. And just expanded from there. Yeah. I mean, was there any particular drummers that were helpful to you when you first came into LA? Um, or um, did you sort of almost feel like, okay, I've got to prove myself? Well, you know, drum, no, I mean... The, the one guy I remember that was a huge help pre my move there was early 90s was Jeff Beccaro. Okay. He was right. absolutely okay. wonderful. Because my p first performance in the US was at uh, a really big event that Remo put on called Remo Day okay, at yeah. UCLA. Yeah. That was 89 and Remo Valley invited me out for that because we met in Australia. I toured with him in Australia. And he wanted me to come out and uh, put me on the bill with Jeff, with Vinny, with uh, who else was on that day? Greg Bissonnette, uh, Myron, um, Sonny Emery. Just, it was such a big day. And I was like this wild card, unknown kid from Australia. And I remember Jeff standing side of stage. And then when I came off, he just, he just came up to me. And we were good friends. Wow. after that and he took me he would pick me up from my hotel he'd take me to gigs his gigs he, he took me to uh, one of his sessions in those days the Picaro the Lucifers they were doing it basically Toto were these the session yeah. musicians in town they were doing everything I went to one of their sessions he invited me to a uh, a Toto rehearsal they were rehearsing for the Kingdom of Desire yeah know it very well record yeah. 
I just hung around the rehearsal. He was he was so nice to me, and unfortunately, it wasn't long after that when I was back in Australia. And in fact, I picked up the paper one morning, and it was, there was an obituary in the paper that he'd passed away. It was such a shock. Yeah, and uh, so young. He was such a wonderful, wonderful, kind human, and genuinely, genuinely. Uh, Wanted to help. Yeah, know. we con we were constantly talking on the phone from there. He, like I said, he'd pick me up on on the way to his gigs when I was in LA, and he, he was just so kind. Something I'll never forget. Yeah. yeah. Well, because that community of drummers, especially now with, I mean, I don't want to pigeonhole you, but you're that now at that top level. You know, Weckles. Jojo, Vinny, um, all those guys, and I know that they're all friends of yours as well. Um, how does that, is there ever like, do you ever feel there's, not with those particular guys, do you ever feel that there's any kind of competition or is everyone very supportive in what people are trying to do? Look, it, it, I think it's the nature of human beings to be competitive. And I think if you deny that, you're lying to yourself. But despite that, the friendship and fraternity and respect that exists between us is unquestionable. And and that's fine. And when I say competitiveness, it's not like a sporting competitiveness. No, no. It's not like you have to go out and beat that guy. It's, it's a competitiveness with me just to excel, to better myself on a daily basis. To draw inspiration when I see the great players, even some of the young generation players now who are just doing some remarkable things, you draw inspiration. But the minute that you become competitive, I think you're denying your own individuality. Yeah. And and in a way, you may start making the mistake of trying to copy, and that's not what you want. You want to remain yourself. You want to develop your own voice. So to that extent, it's only a healthy competitor. It's, it's, a, it's a motivational, it's an inspiration. It's a motivational force which renews that belief in yourself and says, oh, okay, I need to sit down and keep working on this. That's, that's, what, that's why we call it inspiration. So, so I guess, yeah. So with, with that in mind, I think it's common knowledge to say that you like to practice, yeah. okay? You've always been obsessed with practice and still are to this day. At what stage do you think that become part of your life? Yeah, very like? early, I think. You know, I, I, even when I was going back, a young kid in high school, you know, early years, I was, all I wanted to do was get home and play. You know, had, had to do my homework, of course, Parents would make sure I'd sit down, do it as quickly as possible, and then sit down on my practice kit at the time with my records and just learn, you know, and just practice. Had my weekly lesson and in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, the rest of the time I'd be listening to play, I'd be transcribing, I'd be practicing, you know, my independence, my handwork, some footwork doing all the drills, all the fundamentals. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on fundamentals and something I rarely do now. But I guess, you know, you, as you evolve as a musician over the years, your, your, your routines and your needs change. Yeah. So often I get asked in clinics, you know, what, you know, what, what do you practice? What, you know, what, as if they're asking me the question in, in in view of what they should be practicing. Yeah, say, yeah. Look, yeah. What, when I answer that question, it's not directed at what you should be practicing. What I'm doing now is after 50 yeah. year plus years of playing. It's not what you should be doing. You, know. uh, you can get inspiration, but you need to work your way up. You need to not neglect the fundamentals. Keep, keep working on developing your, your touch, sensitivity with the sticks in hand. Which requires a lot of, a lot of, like I said, rudimental work, fundamental things. Um, you know, be, be, keep trying to develop your, your, your ear, your musical ear, your, your timing. 
you know, there's so so many nuances that go into what we do that you become aware of over the years and think, oh wow, why didn't I think or feel that back then? Yeah. Because it takes time for the brain to make sense of all this information and to and to give it give it life through your playing. Has your has your technique changed much over that time? Yes, I think several times I've consciously changed. You're talking about the fundamental technique, the yeah. fulcrum. Yeah, the, the fulcrum. The way you hold. The way that it you has. Use. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, I find that I, and, you dig now with your, especially with the traditional grip, but you've never really strayed away from it. But that's that's changed quite considerably, hasn't it, over the years? Do you think, or not really? Uh, not so much the traditional grip. It's just again, it's the nuances, the touch, the yeah. feel, the, that sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, that took. A long time to develop because traditional is not an easy grip to no. master. It requires more maintenance. You know, it's not a natural movement for the wrist. To be honest, if I was totally honest with you, uh, just between you and I, okay. <laughs> I would. If I was to start over, I'd play match. Match grip. Yeah. 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 No one heard that, but no, yeah. I think we all would. Yeah. It's. Yeah. Having said that, I really enjoy playing traditional. But it was a struggle to get there. And also because I was a, a bit of a hard head. I didn't want to compromise. When I was playing in the loud and heavy rock bands, I didn't flip over into match. No. I decided I'm, I need Stick to learn. Yeah. So by being persevering and being adamant that I would do it that way, I was able to develop you know, very, very powerful traditional grip as well as a sensitivity and so now that I've put all this time and effort into it I'm really at this point in my career I have no intention of changing anything right, anymore. Right. You know, I've come a long way. Um, you do lots of things. You run on a, your own band or bands. Um, I know you've just been writing, recording for the last eight months for the, for the new album coming out, etc uh, etc. Et what inspires you still? I hope you don't you don't mind me saying your age, sixty no. years old. What Not inspires you still? I'm inspired. I, I, daily inspiration comes from the fact that I'm an artist, and I feel what a privileged life we lead as an artist. You're essentially doing what excites you every day, what you love doing. Despite the fact that it has its challenges, it has its frustrations, it, but nevertheless you're doing it with a purpose. You're doing it with an end game, there's an end result, you know, doing it for yourself, for the furthering of the art itself. And that's inspiration to me, and I feel like I, every, every time you think that you're getting you're getting older and, and maybe at some point you're just going to kind of plateau and lose interest or get to a point where you think, oh, you know, I've done enough. Or, I'm at that point where I feel like, oh, I'm just getting to that point where I <laughs> was desiring to be. I think I'm, now I can, I can envision something else. I need to go there. Yeah, That's my motivation. I still feel I have a lot of energy and... I want to keep, I think I'm writing my best music now, producing my best records right now at this point in life. And I think, well, I'm not going to quit while I'm just starting to, to produce what I've always wanted to produce, you know. And while I have health and vitality, um, so be it. Well, Let's keep doing it. Thank you. And definitely. So cheers. Thank you for sharing. And keep going for the next 60 years. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for what you're doing for the drumming community. Well, Not only in the UK, but spreading around the world. I get to drink coffee with guys like you. Oh. What else could you want? Okay. <laughs>